Great. The good thing about the light is that I can't see exactly you all, and I know there's a lot of you still out there after lunch. So how was lunch? Samash? I, I was playing around with the idea of trying to do this in French, and I gave it up in the first five seconds. I said I would, I would still be here tomorrow explaining about these things. So I come from Finland. My name is Mikko, and uh, I uh, would like to uh, touch on this topic of the future of design thinking by going back a bit in time. You'll see how I'll do that in a minute. And uh, then I'd like to reflect a little bit also on, on the kind of foundational issues on design thinking. Well, what's sort of, what's out there in terms of all of this and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, uh, one of the things that we have been doing at Alta for the last 20 years, since 1995, is, has been taking engineers, designers, and uh, business students at the master's level, and putting them together, almost like putting them in a paper bag. Then we throw the bag around, we mix it around a little bit, and then we pour it open and see what happens. And we do that with, with lots of industry partners, lots of so, uh, social sector partners, social enterprises, businesses, for-profit, not-for-profit. And it seems to be that we're doing something right, because we've, in a way, created a whole generation or, uh, of, of, of people who somehow act as connectors. And it's an interesting phenomenon to see where they actually end up. Uh, being a public university, we don't keep really track that much of where our students end up. And we actually are really bad at that. We suck in that area. We should know more. Anyway, we know that some of them end up in very interesting places, and we follow them and see what they do. So there's something that seems to be going right, but what we still are struggling at trying to understand what are the underpinning issues of, of the thing. What are actually those issues that we should really be paying attention to when we move to the next phase of, of, of this activity? Uh, some inspirations for the presentation of today. But let me start this whole thing by, by introducing uh, Doris. Doris... Uh, was, unfortunately is no longer, about that long, black, hairy, run, run, ran very fast, uh, was a lovely pig from Melanesia. And um, I'll get back to Doris a bit later on, 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 on why do I actually want to do that. So. Uh, think, close your eyes for a little bit. Think of yourselves on, 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 an, on an ocean in, on a sailing ship, uh, 1,771 is the year, and you're part of the crew of Captain James Cook sailing in the South Pacific. And then suddenly something starts to show a red light in the horizon, something strange out there, and you get closer and you get closer, and you then you find that it's a volcano, it's an active volcano. Well, 2030, uh, 230 years later, that volcano is still active, and this is what it looks like maybe 15 years ago. So Captain Cook was sailing around the world, uh, in South Pacific, and finding out things. Um, why is it? Well, why, why, why was he there? Uh, that's one of the key things that, that one wonders uh, in, in, in this world. What, what, what on earth was he doing there? And I, I would suggest he was filling in the disciplinary larder. Because before the middle of the 1700s, disciplines were pretty unified, and it was the explosion in scientific knowledge that started to really drive the disciplines uh, forwards. So he, he was out there. He was looking for experiences. He was looking for knowledge. He was looking for things to do. And uh, we can uh, have to turn the next one. And the key thing is, we think that Captain Cook discovered Vanuatu, and then you look at the local people sitting on the mountain in the middle of the 1700s and say, hey, we've just been discovered. <laughs> so, you know, whose reality are we actually writing here? And this is something that you, you really need to look at in design thinking always, is whose reality are we constructing? Is it mine? Is it yours? Is it ours? How, how do we actually go about doing that? And, and what are the drivers in this? While Captain Cook was cruising around as the original yachty in the South Pacific, um, we, we, we kind of saw this rise of disciplines in this part of the world. 
The cranes, uh, this is from the wonderful French construction industry, took it as an example here. Very sophisticated new type of technical solutions coming out in the 1700s. Uh, the beginnings of industrialization, the beginnings of certain lines of thinking that in fact somehow led to design thinking also. Uh, with, with also the negative sides that are actually deterring us from going further in terms of... Uh, of, of the design thinking. The rise of disciplines was an important issue and, and we look at the, the, the thinking, how it has evolved, what has actually caused it to evolve, so on and so forth, and we can sort of try to understand some of the issues. Push the agenda 100 years forwards. Scientific management, by then management as, as a discipline, had evolved quite interestingly. It had become a science. Being a management professor myself, I also am a professor in design, I'm kind of a bit skeptical about the management science. How can you make a science out of managing people? It's quite difficult. Anyway, people tried, and it was about how to, shall we say, organize work, how to rethink what we do, how to think about efficiencies, productivity, and blah, blah, blah. We all know that. At the same time, we also know that design emerged as, as, as a way to try to make our products better, industrialized, uh, things like that. Uh, I'm simplifying history quite a lot here. But anyway, there was a certain marriage, a long courtship that, that went on, and at, at this end of the time we kind of say that, well, maybe that resulted in design thinking. And when we've been reflecting at, at Alto on, on, on all the different issues that we know about design thinking, you know, the type of abduct abductive reasoning, convergence, divergence, the fact that we do reflective reframing of things, the way that we, we think about uh, trying to understand what users and people do and how they do things and why do they do things is, is, is really, it's an interesting phenomenon. It's a little bit here, a little bit there, lots of links to anthropology, Lots of links to many other things here, so designers have always been great at borrowing from other, other uh, disciplines and, and so on and so forth. Um, when we really dig deeply into it, one of the sort of uh, observations that we've been having is at the root of everything you have collaborative work. And uh, this seems like a really sort of a self-evident issue, but we never really thought about it as a, as, as a root cause, as, as a foundational aspect of design thinking until it suddenly dawned on us on the coffee table that it's not really even collaborative work, it's purposeful collaborative work. There's a purpose tied to it. We do it for a reason. And that reason, rationale, the reason ties, it, ties that to the sort of the innovation discussion of doing something new which is useful and somehow successful. So we, we, we think that uh, uh, this kind of has driven our activities for the last uh, years in terms of trying to understand what design thinking is and where is it going to. So power of human collaboration. Let's jump back a bit to the story of Doris here. Um, South Pacific. Imagine ourselves. This is uh, Anno DT, so the years before design thinking. 20 years ago. Um, and of course, designerly ways of thinking have been around for a very, very long time. Just look at what Nigel Cross was writing on earlier on and, and many other people. But then the situation was that technology had arrived, so you had outboard motors, you had cars, you had transport, you had systems of communication, you had commercial systems which were available even in the most remote uh, corners of, of the islands. 80 islands, 60 inhabited. Uh, the, the size of a huge European country from north to south. So lots of things happening there, and, and, uh, and but there was a lot of fear of the unknown. So people had the traditions of elect, uh, erecting these slit drums or slit gongs uh, at, the, at the beach landings to ward off evil spirits. And uh, when, we, when we were looking at uh, our tasks at that point in time there, we sometimes felt that we were part of that evil, evil spirit gang that was invading something which was not yet ready for us. Um, and um, we then recognized, however, that there was a lot of things happening behind this. 
People were building towers, as you might know, the New Hebrides or Vanuatu, that is, as it is called today, is the original place uh, of, of the bungee jumping, where people build towers and jump off them. It's, it's very, very strange. Uh, and uh, I was offered the choice of going up to one of these towers. I, I didn't even have the guts to climb up the tower, so no, no, not, not even to talk about jumping off one of them. Not, not my ball game. I, I have enough risks in doing other things in life. So, uh, so what, we, what were we there to do? We had been asked by the European Union to look at developing education. And this is the tenuous link that I have of this story to the public sector. If we think about what the public sector should be doing in the world uh, today, educating citizens or enabling learning, rather, is one of the key tasks. Health is perhaps another one. Security, a uh, third one, perhaps. And uh, so I'm going to stay in the, in the, in the area of education. Being an, uh, an academic by accident it kind of also warms me up to talk about education. So we were there to look at how could we actually uh, engage in developing the junior secondary school education, junior secondary level education. And uh, so we said, okay, fine, we know a lot about this. We have our, our own disciplinary backgrounds from the 1750s. We've been developing disciplines. We are brought up in disciplines. We breathe disciplines. Our societies are arranged around disciplines one way or the other. And for better or the worse, we, we are disciplinary people. And that's why it's so difficult for us to jump out of that. And, and this is why it was such a cold shower for us to start to talk to people who were in some great ways pre-disciplinary or non-disciplinary or to whom our understanding of disciplines had no meaning. The problem was that because globalization was impacting on these bunch of people in the middle of the South Pacific, they had to deal with the fact that a Russian space station was falling into the area near to them, they had to deal with the fact that you have international commerce who is using their sea routes. They had to deal with the fact that they needed skills to survive in the modern world. So there was a need to think education in their contexts. But as such, the fact that we have education which is based on disciplines didn't mean a lot to them. The skills that we had, the disciplines that we have, were made, may not have been relevant for us. So we weren't really getting anywhere. Bringing in something from the very outside uh, and coming in and, and, uh, and trying to do things in, in a European fashion, it just didn't work. We, hadn't, we weren't there for the first time. We were all experienced development people. We had been doing things all around the world. And so it was, we knew all about participatory you know, appraisals. We knew all about all that jargon that is out there previously. We weren't ready for the fact that we had non-disciplinary people meeting us. So what did we do? Remember, design thinking hadn't been invented by, by then. We were, we were designers, partly ourselves and partly engineers and other people. So what did we do? We went, we went back and we started looking at the root causes of, of, of what we had here. We had the resources, if you look at the triangles below, uh, kind of on a, on a minimal level. We had the financial, the human uh, resources, the physical resources even. We, we, we also knew what we wanted to do on a wide, uh, wide way. So in a way, the activities, we had an idea roughly of them. We also knew what kind of products and services and business models at that point in time. We didn't use this language, of course. This has been constructed afterwards. But we kind of knew what we were wanting to achieve. What we didn't know was how to deal with the socially built constraints that actually stopped us from using our resources. Now, if we think about our life today, in very many corporate cases, in organizational cases, in terms of the public sector, it is the same constraints today that stop us from doing things. And how do we manage to go around them? So insight number one was the role of social constraints in stopping everything, essentially. So what did we do? 
we, we, we knew that we had to have somebody, somebody who would interpret for us. And those of you who read Verganti and Roberto would be ex extremely proud of, of, of us because we're using interpreters here, except we used it 10 years before Roberto. So uh, it was kind of an early, uh, early on thing. We also needed the, the, the architects to do these things. So we needed an interpreter who actually worked between us. We also found somebody from Ambram, a man who was working, working in the whole thing with us. And we said, well, we need somebody who is, can push people into doing things. Ambram is an island of black magic. And so it's great to have somebody from there coming in there and so people saying, okay, we don't really want to argue with the black magician here, so uh, let's, let's get our act on this, let's move on this thing. So we started co-creating schools with the students, with, with uh, communities, uh, interminable amount of time spent sitting under trees, talking, uh, making sense of things, trying to understand where are we going, testing. We kind of invented lean as we, as we went along also because we didn't have the resources. Uh, to do everything that we wanted. So building up our understanding of this. Um, so out of that exercise, we got a couple of insights. Now, I have to say that was 15, 20 years ago, and these insights are from these days. But I think it has been necessary for us to go back to those experiences we had so that we could reflect and understand. What we were trying to do then is, was to move beyond our experiences and their experiences and to create a joint platform. So we were wanting to do that so that we could actually think together. So we were creating new types of concepts of schools. So this kind of concept uh, thinking is really in the, in the middle of this. And we borrow very liberally from Deleuze in this idea of the concept. And it's very, very useful in, in this kind of thing. The other big insight was that in their context, and also I think in our context, educating is becoming. It's not being something. We're not engineers necessarily. We're not this, we're not that. We are continuously becoming something. And this continuous education is perhaps one of the key things that we really need to build into our educational structures today. Going on. Um, one an important insight that we already had at that point in time is it doesn't really matter what skills we teach. Because if you teach skills, people's abilities will rise and they will meet the ceiling and they will not be able to do anything. So just as much as you need to rise people's skill levels, you need to rise the ceiling or the roof of the use of those skills so you can actually go up like that. And this socially built constraints are the biggest boogeyman uh, in our societies today, and that is what design thinking should be focusing on in terms of resolving as we go along. Last but not least, uh, a thought on how can we model innovation, design thinking, those sort of things in, in terms of that. And we started to think, well, actually, it's not a tree. It's not an organized tree which is beautiful to look at where knowledge builds on its other. It's something which is underground. It's hidden, partly, partly visible. It's almost like the mushrooms popping up here and there. You remove a constraint somewhere. You get some light to an area, and suddenly you find new things coming from the underground. This rhizome thinking is actually a fundamental insight that we've been having over the last few years, and we've been trying to understand how could we actually build that into education. And we've, we've been seeing that peer-to-peer -peer learning is very much linked to that. We have so many talented students who know a lot more about specific things, and we let them do a lot of this thing. So what about Doris? Well, uh, Doris was a token. Doris was a trade-off. The European Union gave us, I don't want to say how much money, but enough. Uh, and, and, but the local people gave us their time. They gave us the land, or didn't give us the land. They gave the school the land. They gave us the sand. And in a tropical island, the sand is a problem. You have to dive underwater to get it in small baskets. It's not a mean feat. Um, we gave them construction material. We gave them some expertise. And they built their own schools. 
So it was uh, a trade-off. And in reply to all of the things that we did for them and a lot of things they did for us, they gave us a pig. So that pig was a symbol of collaboration in my books. And uh, so Doris traveled back with a boat uh, from us. And uh, then, then we, we, we had to hit a plane. And so in a, in a rice bag, put him on the back of the plane in the cargo hold. And it was slightly embarrassing because every time we hit a bump, you know, these small planes, you heard this, ee, boom, ee, boom, ee, boom. I say, it's not my pig in the back. I, have, I don't really know whose pig it might be, but uh, there's some pig in the back. So um, Doris lived a long and happy life on a farm, on my farm in the South Pacific. Uh, and uh, at some point in time, she ran out of time. And then we had the most expensive pork chops on the courtesy of the European Union. Uh, but again, I would not like to put that out into the public. So what do we have in, in, in terms of the key issue here? Um, in, in these really open-ended situations where you really don't know what to do, these four elements, uh, basically the type of a, a rhizome thinking, the type of thinking which is related to focusing on constraints more than capabilities, the idea, idea that we can, we can actually create uh, new ways of thinking uh, about creating concepts which start to live up. They, they are starting to build up into a platform of thinking for us on how can we take education-related design thinking forwards. And, but at the bottom of that still is the key insight that, you know, when you really don't know what you should be thinking, when you really can't make any sense of anything, then get a lot of people together and start collaborating to make sense, because that's the only thing that will take you forwards. Thank you.